Do you know how it feels when you discover a series long after it's died, come back, and died a second time? Well, I do. As a kid, we rented Rocket Robot on Wheels, and I loved it. And then I think I blacked out until I bought Infamous on PlayStation 3. It wouldn't be until the mid-2010s I was even aware of Sly Cooper's existence. And even then, I still ignored him until earlier this year, when I finally gave in to my urges and booted up his games. His original trilogy is really easy to sum up. The first game is different to all the others, and it follows a more typical platformer approach. The second game is everyone else's favourite. It replaced the formula and added a lot more characterization and smaller, tighter challenges. The third game is my favourite, and it perfects everything the second game did, while adding a ton of other playable characters who do vary in quality, but they don't really bog down the game too much. Anyway, it's time to boot up the Sly Trilogy, or for the Americans out there, the Sly Cooper Collection. We, uh, we kind of messed up the first game's name here and we had to live with those consequences for quite a while. And if you're playing this on Vita, be prepared for the physical download code no longer being acceptable. So just buy the third game on its own, or if you're in America, cry because the PlayStation Store won't let you buy the individual games, and you'll have to buy the whole collection digitally. But honestly, who other than me is playing this game on Vita in 2021? So anyway, I start the game, I ignore the crunchy cutscenes that had to be compressed for the Vita, and I also ignore the game's title because I do not want to acknowledge us calling it Sly Raccoon. And when I boot up the game proper, I am welcomed by the game's charmingly rough art and character models. On its own, the first game looks good, but with the knowledge of its sequels, this does clearly bear the marks of an early title for the studio. Sly is pretty atypical for the cutesy platformer mascot. He definitely fits in with the slightly edgier PlayStation 2 mascot platformers, but even then he is noticeably darker, yet he's also much more expressive. Since I'm not knowledgeable, I'll just say this game is the end result of cramming the Batman animated series and Crash Bandicoot into a blender, turning it on, and watching the gory liquid settle. But come on, that metaphor isn't justified. This isn't a violent game, it's for kids after all. Anyway, as soon as we boot up the game, we instantly learn that Sly's parents were murdered and he watched them die while hiding from the murderers. Sly is then sent to an orphanage where he meets his fellow orphans, Bentley and Murray, and they eventually grow into a trio of thieves. Or, as this first game shows, a thief, a smart guy, and a burden. Sly's friends do grow and develop over the course of their trilogy, and their involvement in few things does expand, but in this game, we really see Sly Cooper do everything, and his friends are just sitting there in the background getting in the way or helping from a distance. You see, Sly 1 is actually two different games. First, we have Sly Cooper, the platforming levels. This feels like Crash Bandicoot, but expanded for PlayStation 2. These are linear hallways with enemies to kill. They make great use of the environment, and it honestly does feel like it goes well beyond the scope of the first three Crash games. But Sly Cooper is also another game, and that game's quality isn't as good. We have very frequent and annoying minigames that must be completed. Some of these are painless but just take up time, and others take up time but are not painless. If it wasn't for these moments, I would consider Sly 1 to potentially be the best in the trilogy. I really love the tighter, more focused levels, but driving, or protecting Murray, or grabbing computers, these all sour the game for me. This game is still a great addition to anyone's library, whether that be on PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, or the one you can fit in your pocket. Sly 2 is just more of the same. Wait, no it's not, I already spoiled that anyway. Sly 2 changes up everything drastically. Our linear levels are gone and traded in for small hub worlds. These hub worlds have missions scattered across. Our Crash Bandicoot inspired health system is replaced with a more traditional health bar. Our friends actually do something. It's all different and for the most part I'd say it's better for it. I do miss the more focused platforming levels and would love to see the series do this again, but what we have here is a true stealth game instead of Crash Bandicoot with sightlines and alarms. We'll be sneaking, hiding under furniture, pickpocketing, and being upset when we're seen. I feel like this game is not only a fun twist on the stealth genre for veterans, but it's also a fun introduction to the stealth genre. I wish 11 year old me played this to start the genre instead of being terrified by the ghost and hitman contracts. Your missions are small stepping stones to the grand final mission in each world. Everything you do feels like it's worth it, they're part of a much larger plan. In Sly 1, you did levels until you didn't have to anymore. Here, you do missions until your goal is truly achievable. It's fun seeing how things you did an hour ago are relevant later in the same hub world, and it's all truly connected. 
This game is so much fun. I love it, except for when I don't. I might be alone in this, but I do not like collecting the clue bottles here. Sly 1 had clue bottles too, but they were spread across for tighter linear levels. You couldn't miss them. Sure, there was one level that drove me to looking for a guide, but in every other case, I incidentally found them without trying to. Sly 2 tried to reward exploration, but it did it in these surprisingly big and vertical worlds. The worlds themselves are small enough for regular gameplay, but when you're looking for that one clue bottle that blends in with the environment, you'll feel like this is a giant sandbox. This might be less of an issue on later playthroughs, but for a first time where it slowed down my pace and single-handedly made me not put this game as number one. I know it's all optional, but the game is taunting me and knowing that I'm not collecting everything. It brings back bad memories of my 99% Banjo 2 e playthroughs because I can't beat that damn canary. I need a victory, please. Sly 2 may not excel in terms of making me want to collect everything, but it certainly succeeds in its story. Most people put this game on a pedestal for its story, and it's understandable. Hell's a pretty good one for the most part. It's dark where it needs to be, it's lighthearted where it wants to be, and the rest is all adventurous. The stakes are all there throughout, and it puts the other playable characters to fantastic use. This truly is the gold standard for storytelling in mascot platformer games. There isn't much competition, but it's still great. And then we have Sly 3. Many people would say this game has a lot of flaws, but I don't care. If you watch my Dragon Quest 6 or Persona 1 video, you should know I have bad taste. Sly 3 to me is a masterpiece. It perfectly steals everything good Sly 2 introduced and it cut out some of the fat and replaced it with other different fat. I would say if you love Sly 2, you'd love Sly 3, but apparently a lot of others disagree with me. I'd say part of my love for Sly 3 is the fact that the clue bottles were abandoned. Others say this is a bad thing, but I'm happy I can keep the pace up and don't have to look for that last bottle on every level. Maybe Sly 3 could have introduced a system like Sparks' Hint system from Spyro 2 and the Reignited Trilogy? That could have helped instead of abandoning the system outright. But if it's between bogging the pace down as I try to look for something and not, I think I'd choose not to. I can focus more on stealing, which has also been streamlined. We no longer have to sell the items we pickpocket. In the grand scheme of things, I'm saving like, what, a minute or two across the entire game? But that's a minute or two I could spend doing literally anything else. It's a nice feature. Another nice feature is that our hub worlds change their lighting after a certain point. This truly makes you feel like time has passed and the world isn't quite as static. Our cast is truly hiding out and planning their missions, even as the sun rises into the morning and sets at night. The hub worlds also feel like they're better designed for Bentley and Murray, and even if they weren't, their movement options have been dramatically improved. If I took these versions of the characters into Sly 2, I'd feel much more welcome, but Sly 3's level design being much more accommodating makes me love playing as these characters when I don't have to. These characters can even steal now too, which is a feature Sly 2 should have had. It really feels like every second you're playing as any character is well worth it. This game is truly accommodating to them, and it feels like by far the best representation for the trio. It even does more than just make those two more fun to play as, because Sly himself has better combat options and faster movement options. Everything added to this trio is great. Oh, and we also have a bunch of other characters. I mean, they're cool. It wasn't something we needed, and they're not available outside of missions, but they're still a nice addition at the end of the day. People have used the argument that we have too many gameplay options, but I really don't see that being the case. Sly 1 and 2 also had a lot of gameplay options. The difference is we were always playing as the trio. In this game, we have different faces and voices associated with all these other options. Like giving other characters a spotlight would just be a fine addition in its own right, but these new faces are pivotal parts of the game's story and really drive home that things are different for our group. They're getting older, their priorities are changing, and their relationships are also subject to change. Sure, this isn't the big, exciting, climactic end of Sly 2. This is a more down-to-earth story about our places in the world. Well, as much as you can do on a PlayStation 2 platformer, that is. The Sly trilogy is simply fantastic, and I'd say it was ported wonderfully to the Vita. Sure, we have less buttons, but we also don't have that really weird 16x9 glitch the PlayStation 3 version has, so it's a win for me. Sly 1 is a fantastic linear platformer that will bring back memories of the 90s, even though the game itself is from 2002. Sly 2 is a wonderful entry point to the stealth genre, and it tells a great story. And Sly 3 is the one I will defend on the internet for hours and hours on end until I cry because no one else shares my opinion. 